Good evening. So, I've made a couple of videos recently. One was on methadrone and one was on nafarone, where I've explored the chemistry of some legal high drugs, some of which have since been made illegal. And there's been a lot of interest and I've received a lot of messages and people have said to me, oh, can you make one on this drug and can you make one on that drug? And, and it's kind of difficult because there's so many different analogues. First, it's difficult to know what to choose, and secondly, it can be hard to know exactly what to say. But I thought today I'd make a video looking at MDAI, as this has become a particularly popular legal high, and it's received some media coverage recently. You're looking here at an article published in the Mail. What I'm going to do is actually talk you through the science, because when I started this, I knew nothing about MDAI, and so I went out, like any scientist would, to the research literature, and I found some research papers, and I'm going to talk about the science in these papers and show you how people come to conclusions about these drugs. Some people have been very excited about MDAI, claiming it to be non-neurotoxic, and we're going to investigate that claim and what that claim really means. Does it really mean MDAI is not toxic? And where is the evidence on which that's based? Anyway, as always, we're going to start by thinking about the chemical structure of MDAI. As you can see, MDAI is a close analogue of ecstasy, just with a cyclic structure with the amine in instead of a linear one. So we're going to start off by thinking about how you actually discover the properties and effects of a drug like MDAI. There are three possible types of activity that a drug in this class might have. It may act as a stimulant and pump up the body and the heart rate. It may act as a hallucinogen, like LSD and give you visions. It may act as an entaxogen, more like ecstasy, putting you in touch with your emotions and with other people and giving you a sense of empathy. And what you do is you take rats which have been trained to respond to a specific kind of drug, LSD as a hallucinogen, ecstasy as an entactogen, and you see how those rats respond to your new drug, like MDAI. So here you're looking at a table of data showing how the rats responded to LSD, a hallucinogen, and how they responded to MDAI, which is compound 3A. And if you look at the percentage SDL, that's when the rats press the lever in response to the drug, you'll see that at reasonable doses, 100% of rats responded to the LSD. Whereas even at much higher doses, only a quarter of rats responded to MDAI. That shows MDAI does not substitute for LSD. It does not behave as a hallucinogen. On the other hand, rats trained to respond to the entactogen properties of ecstasy responded 100% to ecstasy, compound 1, and also 100% to MDAI, demonstrating that MDAI does have entactogen effects. It's also worth noting that MDAI has no stimulant type properties. This is the way in which the activity of drug molecules is actually worked out in an animal model system. Of course, it doesn't mean that humans would respond in the same way, but it's generally considered to be reasonably effective. Now, going back to the title of the paper, you can see perhaps the most interesting aspect of this compound overall. It's claimed in the title that MDAI is a non-neurotoxic version of an ecstasy-type drug. Well, what was done by Nichols and co-workers was a further rat study. And it's not a very nice one, but I have to explain it so you can understand what is meant. Many drugs cause a problem of serotonin neurotoxicity. When you administer a high dose of the drug, which is typical of kind of repeat heavy use of the drug, then you end up with depressed levels of serotonin in the brain. And this can cause psychological problems, and this is what's meant by neurotoxicity. Well, you give a big dose of the drug to a rat, and then a week later, you examine the brain of the rat to look at the levels of serotonin and all the other different neurotransmitters present within the rat brain. So let's have a look at the data. Across the top of the table are all the different neurotransmitters. We're going to focus in on 5-HT, serotonin. Now for the rat treated with saline, basically nothing, salt solution, the rat had 379 picograms per milligram of serotonin in its brain. However, 
for the rat treated with ecstasy, compound 1, this had fallen to just 161 picograms. This is because ecstasy is serotonin neurotoxic. Now, interestingly, look at the third line for compound 3A, MDAI. The figure for serotonin is back up at 330 picograms per milligram. This was the evidence that you did not get serotonin neurotoxicity in the brain of a rat after acute treatment. One thing that's worth adding to that is because it's kind of very gentle as a drug in terms of its activity, it's just an entactogen, lots of people mix MDAI with something else. Well, there is literature precedent that once you start mixing it, particularly with things that generate dopamine in the brain, then it becomes neurotoxic again. So serotonin doesn't only have actions in the brain of the patient where it has its psychological effects. Serotonin receptors and transporters are also present in other parts of the body, and a particularly key one is found in the heart, and it's called the 5-HT2B receptor. And this receptor, associated with serotonin transport within the heart, plays a key role in the development of valves. Now, there's a huge range of serotonin-like compounds that can go and interact with this particular transporter and can cause cardiotoxicity. They can cause toxicity in the heart and lead to the development of faulty heart valves. As a case study, the worst example of a compound with cardiotoxicity was phenfluoramine. And this drug in particular was given to a significant number of people in terms of weight control and unfortunately it turned out to be a general agonist of the 5-HT2B receptor. That means it made this receptor more active than usual. That changed the way that people's valves developed and it led to significant cardiotoxicity. This is a key area of interest in scientific research and there was a paper, for example, published in the New England Journal of Medicine just a couple of years ago exploring the interface between drug molecules and valvular heart disease. And I'm just going to pop up a key paragraph from that paper talking about the risks of drugs that can interact with serotonin uh, receptors in the heart. On the base of these findings, my colleagues and I have urged pharmaceutical companies and regulatory agencies to screen candidate drugs for the HT2B receptor interactions comprehensively before launching clinical trials in order to prevent FEN-FEN type disasters. Clearly, practitioners should avoid prescribing drugs that are potent 5-HT2B receptor agonists, a growing list of medications that now includes ergot derivatives, dopamine agonists and amphetamine derivatives, including phenfluoramine and methylene dioxymethamphetamine, MDMA or ecstasy. So what's the message with MDAI? Well, one of the reasons I ummed and erred over making this video is I can't give you a clear-cut message. It's not serotonin neurotoxic in the brain, but I have no idea whether the compound will turn out to be cardiotoxic. And again, it comes back to what I've said in all of these videos. They haven't been extensive clinical trials on these kind of compounds. Phenfluoramine looked like a great compound until it was pushed out into the population. It was given to thousands of people and only then did they realize the cardiotoxic side effects. It may be that MDAI is non-neurotoxic and non-cardiotoxic, but it may also not be. This is the potential problem. MDAI, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't been through that screening process. So its potential cardiotoxicity, like the vast number of these legal high substances, simply isn't known until enough people have taken it for us to be sure.